My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. All of the ends of the world shall remember. You know how far away we are from Israel? David surely could not picture that on the other side of a globe, tens of thousands of miles away, 3,000 years later, people would gather around his son and sing a song in a language he'd never heard by a people he'd never heard in a time that was beyond his imagination. And he wrote it down in faith. And we're doing it right now. All the families of all the nations shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules all the nations. Starting about, I don't know, four o'clock yesterday afternoon, as many of you know, I travel a lot around the world, and I have friends around the world. As the sun rose, I began receiving these messages from around the world. I got to witness the resurrection day for 24 hours. As friends from nation after nation sent me, he is risen. They sent it to me in Romanian. They sent it to me in Tamil. They sent it to me in Hindi. They sent it to me in English. From around the world, all the nations of the earth stopped and fulfilled the prophecy of Psalm 22. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over all the nations. All of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even those who cannot keep themselves alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted. We're doing it today. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. There are little kids in here that this will be the first Easter they really actually remember. My granddaughter sat in the back on Friday and she kept hearing Jesus' voice and everybody was singing about Jesus and singing and talking about Jesus. And she said, Papa, where is Jesus? And I thought, we're doing it. We are recounting it to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will yet be born that he has done it. The end of the psalm. Today we do that. We proclaim he has done it. When Paul stood before Agrippa, the king of the people of that region, he said to him, Agrippa, do you not believe the prophets and all that they say? Do you not know about this Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah? And then he said something that we can take home today. He said, this thing was not done in a corner. Why do we have Christmas? Jesus. Why do we have Easter? Jesus. Why do we have a nation? Jesus. This thing was not done in a corner. Why are there orphanages? Jesus. Why is there liberation of slaves? Jesus. Why is there nursing? Jesus. This thing was not done in a corner. It has affected you and everything you know since the day you took your first breath and that nurse cared for you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has affected you your entire life and will affect you for all eternity. It was prophesied. It was all foretold. 1,000 years earlier, David wrote Psalm 22. He also wrote about the Messiah, about God. He said, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Your Messiah will die. My son, David said, will die. But he will not rot. 700 years before Christ, Isaiah was given more detail about the crucifixion of Jesus than the entire New Testament has. More detail than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John combined. 
700 years before it occurred. You know what that's called? That's called prophecy. Only God can tell the future. Everybody else guesses. But he said to Isaiah, almost a thousand years before Christ, that this Messiah will be cut off from the land of the living for the sins of my people. This Messiah will die, but not for his sins. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. He despises shame and he died on the cross that he might redeem you. He gave it all. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He made his soul an offering for sin. If you do not understand why Jesus died, it's because you are going to. And the only way to make sure that you never leave God is for someone to pay everything you did wrong off. To pay it off. To be the punished one that you would never be punished. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that if you'll just believe in him, you'll have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus did not come as the condemner. He came as the savior. We don't rejoice the condemner. We rejoice the savior. And then it goes on in Isaiah, but this Christ shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. The resurrection 500 years earlier, it's prophesied and warned to those who rejected him, to those who insulted him, to those who crucified him, and to every generation from that point forward who refuses him. He gives a warning. 500 years before the Messiah, he says, the Lord, this Messiah will come back, this Christ will come back, and they will look on me whom they pierced. My eyes shall see the Lord. Job said that. In my flesh I shall see God. In my eyes shall see the Lord. In my eyes, not another. He says, oh, how my heart yearns within me. So the resurrection was prophesied. It wasn't done in a corner. It was prophesied. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It is the single greatest event in history and God made sure he had the proper amount of advertising. He gave thousands of years of preparation time. He sent out heralders, not on the street corner flipping signs, but people who went out and gave their lives to make sure that everybody would know that the Messiah is coming. He's coming. And this is how you will know him. I'll give you exact details. They'll rip out his beard. He'll ride on a donkey. They'll crucify him. And he'll be raised on the third day. That way you'll know it's the right Messiah. Prophesied. The single greatest event in history. All pre-announced. All prophesied. If there is no resurrection from the dead, there is no Christianity. Christianity is not a teaching. It's a salvation. If all you have is religion, you're not saved. There must be a resurrection. Paul went on to say, if Christ is not risen, if this is not true, even though it was prophesied, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You go to bed in guilt and in fear of the day of judgment. But if Christ is risen, he has proven, he has shown all the promises are true. All the things he said, if you just believe in me, my father will count you righteous. If you follow me, I will give you life that never ends. What did he tell the Samaritan woman? Look, you're gonna drink this water, but you're gonna come back. But you don't have to do that when you have Christ. There's only one Savior, only one fountain that gives life. And I have found it. But it wasn't just prophesied. It needs to be proven. 
Christianity is based upon an amazing event, an amazing historical event. So it's prophesied and will be proven. And we need to thank this, this Easter, I really rejoiced at his enemies. We need to thank his enemies that they had so much fear that the prophecies might come true, that they gave us the greatest evidence that they did come true. Let me say that again. They had so much fear that the prophecies might come true, they took away all doubt of whether it did come true. For they put everything in his way. No other religious leader in the history of the world was ever killed, executed in front of a large crowd under the direct supervision of an experienced, trained, professional executioner. Can I tell you, Jesus is dead. No other religious leader had their body removed and put in a sealed government tomb. No other religious leader had their own professional guards who on penalty of death must protect this tomb for three days. No other religious leader had an angel burst the tomb door in the very presence of the guards whose lives are at stake if the body is gone. Thank you, Pharisees. Thank you for providing me the greatest evidence that the prophecies not only might come true, the prophecies did come true. No other religious leader was publicly killed and three days later appeared to hundreds and hundreds of people. Mary Magdalene, the group of women, Peter, the two disciples walking to Emmaus, 10 disciples in a room, not counting the women. A week later, 11 disciples in the room, not counting the women. A few days later, seven different men on the Sea of Galilee. Just a little while after that, 500 people on a hillside. That's my Savior. That's the proven, prophesied, predicted Savior of the world. And it happened on this anniversary. Imagine the despair. They had risked everything. They had chosen to follow this man who seemed to be in direct opposition to Rome itself, crusher of nations. They found themselves cast out of the synagogue. The rulers of their community had rejected them. Their families had rejected them. They had given up their occupations. They'd given up their wealth. They'd spent three years following this man. He was going to be the king of Israel. And suddenly he's dead. And now there's just the leftover rebels to deal with. Imagine the despair. Now imagine this woman with a past runs in on Sunday morning and says, I have been to the tomb. The, the, the rock is gone. He's alive. Imagine the pit of excitement and despair and turmoil of your emotions. No, no, that is ridiculous. Could it possibly be he did raise Lazarus? No, no, it can't possibly be. That's impossible. I saw him dead. I saw them wrap the linen around his head with the suffocating ointments that they put on the body. A hundred pounds worth. The guy was encased in wax. He's dead. No, no. He's not dead. And so Peter and John, they run. Maybe, maybe not. Could it possibly be? And they go, and what do they see? They see the very linen wrappings themselves unrolled and folded and placed. And they walk away. Maybe he's alive. 
what would it mean to them? If he's alive, it's all true. If he's alive, he's the king of Israel. If he's alive, he is greater than anything that we have ever imagined. If he's alive, I'm saved. I, uh, I'm going to sit on one of the 12 thrones around God himself and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm going to go to the ends of the earth and I'm going to proclaim in languages I do not know the praises of God if he's alive. After the 500 people, there were two more notable characters. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who according to the very scriptures themselves, did not believe. He was a mocker of Jesus until the resurrection. What changed him? He saw the risen Savior. It's written down in 1 Corinthians. He saw Jesus. And you know what happened? He became a leading man, the pastor, the bishop, the leader of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And they eventually executed him by throwing him off of the temple. And when he didn't die from the great fall, they beat him to death with sticks. Why? Because he saw the resurrection. And then there was this man named Saul, full of hate and evil. And if he knew there was a Christian, he would kill that person. He would haul them off and have them executed. Little kids, old women, it didn't matter. He hated Christians. This was a sham. There was no resurrection. The disciples stole the body. It's a lie. And I'm going to stop this lie before it damages what I believe. And on his way to Damascus to execute people, what happens? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the living, resurrected man, appeared to Paul. Changed his name, Saul to Paul. He never went back to Jerusalem. He did years later. He didn't turn around and go home. From that day forward, he gave up his life and he went and he preached to the known world. He left everything and just traveled and told the story of when he met the living, resurrected Son of God. And he himself was executed by Rome because he would not recant. He would not say it was false. The murderer turned Messiah follower died for his Lord because there is a resurrection. James, because there is a resurrection. It was the resurrection that transformed everything. The prophets who prophesied were right. The enemies who tried to stop became the great witnesses. The hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses became the early church martyrs who would die for their faith. The persecutors of the very church itself were transformed and became the preachers. How does that happen? There was a resurrection. There was a resurrection. It's all true. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He proved it. Not only was it prophesied, it was proven. It was proven. Buddha, he only said words. He proved none of them. He said, wait, wait, you'll see in time to come when you go into nirvana, then you'll know. Of course, that's after you're dead. Muhammad, only words. Wait, no, seriously, there's paradise awaiting you after you're dead. Confucius, wait, it'll all come clear after you're dead. Krishna, wait till death and then you'll know. Jesus, I went to death, I saw it, I whooped it, I'm back. <laughs> there is a major difference there. It was the resurrection that transformed the disciples. They'd already had three years of teaching, but what were they doing after Jesus was dead? Hiding. 
They were afraid. Everything they thought was wrong. It was all confusing to them. They did not understand. But after the resurrection, they were unafraid of death. Why? Because Jesus had been there and Jesus defeated it and he was back. When they saw the Lord alive again, they knew everything was true. Surely, as the centurion said, this was the son of God. And if he said it, it's true. Because it wasn't just words with him. It was proven. This stunning event empowered the Jesus worshipers from that point on to become bold proclaimers of truth, even to death. Even though between that day, that Easter, and this Easter, more than 70 million followers of Jesus have been executed for their faith. And yet, in the midst of this fierce persecution, within 70 years of the resurrection, there were 500,000 followers of Jesus Christ. Now, how does that happen? Unless there's a resurrection. And then, by the end of the next 100 years, there will be more than 2 million believers in Christ. And to date, from the first Easter to this Easter, we have seen more than 4 billion people in hundreds of languages, hundreds of countries, hundreds of colors, only three or four actually, <laughs> come to Christ. This is not an English God. This is not even a Jewish God. This is not a Chinese God. This is not an Arabic God. This is the God of, what does it say in Psalm? The God who is the king of all nations. He made us. He has saved us. We celebrate it today. In 2012 and in 2016, there was a survey which really surprised me and encouraged me. In 2016, Rasmussen's survey said 77% of American adults believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. That stunned me. Really? And I looked it up and I found that it was true. You know how I found it was true? Because of the response of the critics. On Rasmussen's Facebook page, I found, quote, three quarters of Americans are gullible and willfully uneducated. Another responder said, there is not a shred of proof that he was God or any of that nonsense. Really? Well, that's where I'm going to get my facts. <laughs> or I could ask E.M. Blakelock, who is the professor of classics at Auckland University, a historian. Listen to him. You can get it from Facebook or you can get it from him. He says, I claim to be an historian. And I tell you that the evidence for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ is better authenticated than most of the facts of ancient history. Or you can ask Professor Thomas Arnold, the author of this volume called The History of Rome and the Chair of Modern History at Oxford University. Or you can get it from Facebook. This guy says, I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved better by better and fuller evidence of every sort than the great sign which God hath given us that Christ died and he rose again from the dead. Brooke Foss Westcott, an English scholar, said, raking all the evidence together, it is not too much to say, and I say it today, that there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. More than 52% of American adults today, which includes you, maybe you only come to church Easter. There's a lot of people that that's the fact. More than 52% of Americans come to church on Easter. More than half of American adults. Why? Because they know there is something. 
you know there is something. This isn't just religion. There's something. One of the oldest questions that we have written down in the world comes from a book called Job. One of the oldest questions for Job is 2,000 years before Christ. And even back then, so we're talking 4,000 years ago, he said, if a man dies, shall he live again? That's the great question. That's why people come to church. If I die, is there hope? Can a man live again? And that question waited a long time for an answer. Lots of preachers saying, yeah, yeah, be encouraged. But nobody proved it. Nobody proved it. Isaiah died. He didn't come back. Elisha died. He didn't come back. David died. He didn't come back. Who could prove it? If a man dies, shall he live again? Who can make such a promise and keep it? Jesus Christ. And he did. And in so doing, he said it's all true. He stood by Lazarus' grave, a man who had been dead so long that he actually had begun to rot. He was a corpse. And his sister came to him and said, Oh, Jesus, I know you could have saved him if, he, if you'd been here when he was sick. Because I know you've healed the sick. If you'd just been here when he was sick, like a doctor, I know, you could, I know you can give medicine for the sick person. And Jesus said, he'll rise again. And Martha said, I know. I know at the resurrection, that thing that they all talk about that we've never seen, it's coming, that resurrection. And Jesus responds, blessed be his holy name. I, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection, Martha, and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He answered Job's question 2,000 years later, standing by a dead man's gravesite. If you just believe in me, you'll live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says to Martha, do you believe this? And then he stepped over and he said, Lazarus, come out of the grave. And this man came pouring out with grave clothes on, stumbling out. He'd been dead four days. Let's see Buddha do that. I'd like to see Muhammad accomplish such a feat. And then he did it with his own life. The resurrection. Without the prophecy and without the proof, we have nothing. But I thank God. I'm a Christian and a follower of Jesus because I have both. The prophecy and and the proof. So these words can bring me peace. But they're only words unless there's a resurrection. Since there was a resurrection, that means whatever Jesus taught was true. The Bible tells us because of the resurrection, all of our enemies have been vanquished. Death, sin, hell, grave, the devil. I'm free. I'm saved. I don't care if the whole world decides to kill me. I'm going to live again because my Savior lives. Everybody, according to this scriptures, the scriptures, everybody will now stand before the resurrected Son of God to be judged. That's what Paul told the Athenians. He's like, you know what? God's going to judge the whole world and he's chosen to do it with the one man who is sinless. And he will judge perfectly and we know that because he was resurrected from the dead and the Athenians laughed. Oh, resurrected from the dead. Who can believe that? But he was. Saul could have said, you don't understand. I used to kill the people who followed him till I saw him face to face and met him. And the last thing that the resurrection proves is that now, because Jesus Christ is alive, he's always with you. He'll never leave you. That's what he said. Going to the heaven, I'm going to send my spirit 
so you're never alone ever again. And in fact, because of my resurrection, the Bible says you will now have the power to overcome anything that ever happened to you. Any sin which has crushed your life, any issue is small bringing the dead back to life. And I did that, and I will save you. Now, I remember when I heard this. First time I heard it, I was 10 years old. Maybe there's some 10-year-olds out there hearing it. And I remember it grabbed my heart. And I remember I, I took home a, memory, a verse from the Bible school. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, who knows the rest of it? shall not perish but have everlasting life. Can I tell you that I had no more influence of Christianity in my life than that. But I had this little verse that grabbed my heart and I prayed every night for more than a week. Please save me. I believe. I love. Please save me. I didn't pray it with my grandma. I didn't pray it with my family. I didn't pray it with my sister. Just me and Jesus. Again and again, I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Can I tell you that though my life was a twisted up mess and a wreck, and though I sinned again and again, God had a hold of my heart, and there came a time when he said, are you done, Travis? And I was sitting under a tree at Stewart Park when somebody began to read the prophecies. And there's a lot of them. And saying, guess what? That was proven. That was proven. And I began to think as I sat there, oh my goodness, this thing I believed as a little child, it might be real. And then I was afraid. Because I had lived a life of sin. And God's great mercy was poured out on me. And I came to Christ. Christ. And I'll tell you what, my life has been transformed from Saul to Paul and I am ready to die because I will live. My Savior was resurrected and this is the day we celebrate. So this is a question for you. What difference does all this make? If it was prophesied thousands of years, specifically, exactly predicted, if it was proven by the very enemies of Christ himself, what difference does it make to me? That's the question. It may be against your science, your logic. It may be against your own experiences. That doesn't matter. My only question is, is it true? And if it's true, what are you going to do about it? Because if it's true, it changes everything. We are your testimony today. It's true. Your, your history is your testimony. The enemies of Christ are your testimony. Your archaeological digs are your testimony. He's coming again. Romans chapter 10 says this. The word is near you. It's in your mouth. Today you can be saved. That's what the scripture is saying. Just to make sure everybody understands. It's near you. It's right here. What you decide to do with this determines your future. That's what it says. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which I am preaching. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. I'm clean. As soon as I believe, I am clean. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, anybody, anybody, anywhere, no matter how far away from 
Israel you might be. Anyone who believes on Jesus Christ will never be put to shame. So I'm going to ask you to do something with me today. I'm going to ask you to proclaim your salvation. And here's what you're going to do. You're just going to repeat a phrase. And if you believe this in your heart, I tell you today you are saved. It's this. Jesus is Lord. And I believe he rose from the dead. Jesus is Lord. And I believe that he rose from the dead for me. If you believe that, you never need fear another thing. For the risen Son of God is your protector, savior, lover, friend, and eternal king. This is Easter. May he be praised. Father in heaven, we bless the name of Jesus Christ, resurrected Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Thank you for the mercy upon this soul. Thank you. Thank you. I heard the message and I believed and I say myself, I believe in the resurrection because it's believable. Thank you for the prophecies. Thank you you didn't do it in a corner. Thank you that you shook up the whole known world and all day long for the last 24 hours, people have been rising and in all their languages proclaiming Jesus is risen. Blessed be the name of the Lord God. May this message be our salvation. And if there be any who have a heart of unbelief, I pray you haunt them in their dreams, in their music, in their friends, in their books, in their imaginations, in their fears, in their situations. Just absolutely do what you did for me and chase them down and tackle them to the ground and open their eyes forcibly, Lord, if need be, to see the truth that they also might be saved. Spirit of God, I know that you love us and that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved father happy resurrection day send your son soon amen god bless you all